Uh, good evening, good afternoon, or good morning, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our online conference today, or perhaps tomorrow if you're watching the recording. Uh, before giving the floor to our dearest guest, I want to introduce our team. I'll be the moderator of today's conference. My name is Madonna Ahopadze. I'm the last year neurosurgery resident in Georgia, uh, Sakart Fellow, and I'm also a PhD candidate in Tbilisi, capital of Georgia. A couple of words about our online education meetings. They have started with Professor Hassan Kamil Suju. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Hassan. Uh, he is present uh, today. Uh, he is the program manager of the neurosurgery department of Izmir Atatürk Training and Research Hospital in Turkey. And it goes on with the contribution of all the residents and also with the contribution of all the neurosurgeons who have graduated from the same department. And as well, neurosurgeons and neurosurgery residents from nearby countries like mine, Georgia, Sakatvelo, as well as Ukraine, Bulgaria, uh, Kazakhstan, Pakistan, and many others. Um, now, about the protocol of today's meeting, all the microphones will be turned off during the presentation of the lecture to avoid any voice or noise uh, pollution. You can ask your questions by writing them in a chat part of the Zoom program. And at the end of the presentation, uh, your questions will be asked to the lecture and all of them will be discussed. A mutual discussion is not appropriate for the format of our meeting. And now I would like to introduce our guest. It is my privilege to present our lecturer today, Professor Dr. Jean Anderson Eloy. Uh, he's a currently affiliated with the Cooperman Barnabas Medical Center, and he's a professor and the vice chair of otolaryngology, head and neck surgery at the Rogers, New Jersey Medical School. He serves as the director of the renology and the sinus surgery, director of the otolaryngology research, and a co-director of the endoscopic skull base surgery program. He is currently the president of the University Physician Associates of New Jersey, the faculty practice, uh, practice plan of Rogers New Jersey Medical School, and the vice president of the Doctor Center Management Corporation, the vice president of the New Jersey Academy of Otolaryngology, New Jersey Academy of the Facial Plastic Surgery, and the chair and the chief of service uh, service of the uh, Department of Otolaryngology had a neck surgery at the Cooperman Barnabas Medical Center. Throughout his career. Career, uh, Dr. Eloy demonstrated a thirst and the proficiency for research, education, and excellence in the patient care. His contributions to the fields of otolaryngology, uh, head and neck surgery, and neurological surgery include over 420 journal articles, over 390 peer-reviewed articles, three books, and 30 book chapters in a subfield of rhinology, endoscopic sinus, and the skull base surgery, over 440 scientific presentations at the regional, national, and international otolaryngology and neurosurgical meetings, as well as over 260 invited lectures and oral presentations. His research topics encompass a wide area of the fields of otolaryngology, neurological surgery, ophthalmology, and include endoscopic and open sinus surgery, minimally invasive endoscopic skull base surgery, mold practice on otolaryngology, as well as the studies of the gender disparities in otolaryngology and other surgical specialties. Dr. Eloy has started a successful fellowship program in rhinology and endoscopic skull base surgery, and he's involved in the otolaryngology head and neck surgery resident training. His clinical and surgical interests and areas of expertise include medical and surgical management of refractory rhinosinusitis, endoscopic management of rhinosinus neoplasia, cerebrospinal fluid rhinorrhea, ventral skull base lesions, endoscopic revision of sinus surgery, and computed aided si uh, sinus surgery. Uh, pardon me for the long introduction, but there is no help in it. This is how uh, who our honored professor is. I welcome you, Professor Eloy, again. Uh, now virtual stage is yours, and you can start your screen sharing. Thank you. Professor, you can share a screen now. Okay. Can you see this? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So just wanted to say thank you again for this great opportunity. Um, it's always um, a pleasure to be able to speak to an international audience. Um, I'd like to, um, again, say thank you to the program committee 
for putting this together. Um, I'm sure that um, there's a lot of educational material uh, out there, but um, when I was asked to give this lecture, I went back and, and review what this was. Uh, my initial um, thought was, well, I don't know what this is. Let me just say no to it. And I talked to my colleagues and realized how oh, great a job you guys are doing. So please continue this because this is helping people to outdo well. Um, I also like to say that I do not have any disclosure um, with the material that I'm gonna um, present here. Most of the material is um, things that I've actually experienced in my practice. It's not an all encompassing way of doing things. There's multiple different ways of achieving similar results or even better result. But this is um, just based on what I've learned over the last um, um, 14 and a half years being in practice. And, uh, and the way I do things um, in our center. So I will start, um, let's see if that works. Um, this, this is my two kids, always wanna put them in those lectures, um, sort of keep me grounded because um, they always remind me when I'm at home that I'm just dad. And I just gotta act like dad, take the trash out, um, do everything else like, like um, all of us do. Um, and um, great thank you to my some of my past fellows. Um, those are the people who work with me, do a lot of the videos that you guys are gonna see. Um, and they are amazing individuals, extremely smart, and they're all now doing great job in their careers. So uh, introductions uh, in terms of CSF League. Um, Typically, this is a disruption in the arachnoid and dual matter. If the arachnoid and dual are intact, typically you would not have a, um, a leak, um, even if you have an osseous defect. So to get a CSF leak, you need the disruption in the arachnoid and dual matter. This is typically associated with an osseous defect, you have bony defect. And because typically intracranial pressure is higher than the um, intranasal cavity, you're gonna have leakage of CSF. Um, typically you could have that being associated with herniation of the dua um, and sometimes the brain. If it's just the dua that's herniated then you call that a meningo cell. Um, if you have brain parenchyma also going through the defect then you call it an encephalocell and you've heard the term meningo encephalocell as well. Uh, so because of the underlying reason for the disruption, dis disruption affects the philosophy, typically we would um, characterize those uh, according to the etiology of the CSF leak. So sim simple way of thinking about it, you could have a def you, have, you need a defect in the arachnoid and do do I to have a CSF leak because that's what contains the liquid. And then there's some nomenclature depending on whether or not you have the encephalocell versus just a meningo encephalocell. So the etiology is what can cause this could be scorbis trauma, could be people who've had prior sinus surgery or prior neurosurgical procedures, or it could be a, a, the spontaneous uh, uh, form of getting a CSF leak. Um, typically, when you get a spontaneous CSF, like this is associated with an elevated intracranial pressure. Now, the risk of meningitis is about 10% to 37% if you're treating them with conservative management. Um, if you characterize it in terms of traumatic cases, about 1.2% risk of having, of having a leak, um, an, uh, an infection per day for the first two weeks. This goes up to 7.4 per week for the first month, 8.1 per month for the first six months, and about 8.4% per year. Of course, in different manuscripts, different papers are gonna quote different uh, numbers. Um, so the key steps when you're dealing with those is one, you gotta make sure that this is actually a CSF leak. This is not just rhinitis uh, that the patient is having or another form of infection causing uh, the discharge coming from the nose. Uh, once you confirmed it, um, then the idea is, well, we're gonna need to repair it, but to repair it first, you need to know exactly where it is. So you need to be able to localize that, uh, the, uh, the CSF leak uh, in the score base, and then you go ahead and, and you repair. Um, how do you confirm if a patient has a CSF leak? Um, there's multiple th tests, multiple things that people look at. 
Um, there's the wing side, the glucose testing, a better to transfer in, a better trace protein, and a radionuclide nuclide sister sternography. Of those, um, I don't use all of them. I'm gonna go over them and tell you which one I favor and which one I don't use. The wing side is um, what you see in here, where you have blood and CSF produce a wing um, that you could see in 30 to 90% of the times. This is something that has very low specificity. Uh, and because of that, I do not recommend um, using it. And most people don't recommend using that um, to make a diagnosis of a CSF link. Um, second is the glucose testing, which is another one that I recommend against. Um, the traditional belief is that only the presence of CSF would lead to a positive glucose result, um, and that glucose would be undetectable in healthy patients. However, uh, glucose can be detected in 50% uh, of patients with viral rhinitis, 90% of patients with DM, and 52% of patients in the ICU from their nasal secretions. So because of that, uh, you could tell that if you do get that as a result, um, you cannot really rely on it as though there's a CSF link. So this is why we would not advise people to do this, this uh, test. And then better to transparent uh, testing is something that I typically use. Um, a better to transfer is a glycoprotein, which is present in CSF, but not in your typical nasal secretions. The sensitivity is about 97%, specificity is about 99%. The um, uh, positive predictive value is 97%, and the negative predictive value is 99%. Those are pretty good numbers. And as a result, um, I, I like to use this test in almost all the patient um, when I'm suspecting a, um, a CSF leak. Of course, there are cases where everything is obvious, uh, specifically in positively, if you have a leak, you don't necessarily need that. You just go ahead and repair it without needing to, to, to send this out. And uh, better trace protein is another good test that I would recommend. The only issue is this is not, uh, this is limited in the United States. Um, I know in Europe, people are, have access to it. Um, great sensitivity and specificity. Um, so this is also one thing that I would consider um, people can use um, to make the diagnosis. And the way your nuclear cystonography is another test, uh, maybe useful in cases where you have slow or intermittent CSF leak where you cannot really get enough sample to make a, a diagnosis. Um, sensitivity is, is not that, that great, 76 to 100% but really highly specific, which makes it a good test. But still, again, um, I don't think it's useful in most cases. So unless you have a patient who really you cannot collect um, the CSF, I would, I would actually not work, um, um, advise to get that test as, as a first line. But there's some utility to it. Now, once you've made the diagnosis, the key, second key thing you're going to need is you need to localize the, the side of the CSF rhinorrhea because that's what's going to allow you to really make, um, uh, repair it with the least amount of disruption to the um, sinonasal cavities. If you think about it, if you're going to have to go and really explore the whole score base, um, you may end up doing a bigger surgery than you need to. So in general, uh, try to localize it. A high resolution computer tomography is usually the, the basic standard that can actually help in, almost, in most of the cases. Um, if you're concerned that there's a significant uh, um, intracranial problems or there's a big encephalocele as well, you complement that with the mag magnetic resonance imaging and MR. And um, those are the two men things that I would use in my, um, in, in my practice um, with, the, with uh, CSF final years. And uh, people talk about the magnetic resonance cystonography, which can be done, CT cystonography. Uh, all of those are good. Um, uh, the CT cystonography in particular is, is nice in terms of localization. It's not as expensive as the MRI cystonography. So if I'm gonna really want another test after a high resolution um, CT and an MRI, I would get the CC cystonography instead. And uh, when um, I'm doing the surgery during the repair side, uh, I typically would use intra intrathecal fluorescein. 
I don't do this as a diagnostic test. I use it during the surgery itself to know exactly where I'm going uh, to repair it. And that's also quite important in cases where you have multiple sites of leakage and um, you repair the most um, obvious site and the patient might have other sites. Um, that would actually help you figure this out so that you could repair all the different uh, score based defect sites at the center. This is what we see in YouTube. Everybody sees this picture with your typical um, CSF leak. Most of the time you ask the patient to do a Valsalva maneuver and um, that would be enough to make the diagnosis. Um, typically it's gonna come from one um, nasal cavity, not both. Um, and the history is usually pretty clear, okay? So, um, your typical patient with spontaneous CSF rhinorrhea, they're gonna be middle-aged women, overweight, um, and occasional history of previous head trauma. Although that's not the only patient that you see with those, you could see it in, in, in middle-aged male. We see them on younger people as well. But most commonly, this is gonna be your typical um, phenotype of patient that you're gonna see um, with this disease. And you would see um, your um, defect um, in the score base, um, there's um, been some um, report about whether or not this was coming from Sternberg Canal. Um, then it was found that this was not really uh, coming from Sternberg, Sternberg Canal. Um, but um, bottom line is you typically see the side of the leakage in the lateral um, wall of the sphenoid or the anterior uh, portion of the cribriform, really where the score base is thinnest. And with the chronic intracranial pressure, that's where you're going to have the outpouching of dua and the defect is gonna cause, is gonna be cause. This is one of my patients, again, um, middle-aged woman, um, a little bit overweight, um, and you could see these drops um, that tells you pretty much the diagnosis. Typically, we try to collect that. If for some reason you cannot collect enough fluid, you could give the patient a um, small, um, a small, um, cup, specimen cup, and ask them to go home and collect that. You tell them to put that in the refrigerator as they're collecting it. And uh, within a week, they should come back and should have enough sample to send to, to make the diagnosis. Um, this is this uh, patient here who had an unusual location of this defect, which was right of one of the um, basilar artery here uh, with uh, an encephalocele that we, we went up and, and, and repaired. And this is the same patient in a um, corona scan. Um, okay, and typically coronas are usually best um, because of the lateral um, defect side, which is most common, but in this case, um, it was not there. Now let's uh, switch a little bit in terms of score based defect repair in general, uh, not just for like a small um, CSF leak. Um, when you're gonna make the, the you're, you're gonna do your surgery, the degree of difficulty is typically based on the location of the defect, okay? Um, no matter where you have a duo tear, may it be a small from a CSF leak that's spontaneous or from previous surgery, um, some locations are harder than, than others. Um, and the way I think of it in my mind is that there's some areas that I'd like to repair and there's some area that I'm always a little bit concerned about no matter how experienced you are. Um, cellular defect in general, usually usually after surgery, they are really the easiest one to repair, right? Um, the cribriform area is the second one um, to repair. And the reason why the cribriform is easy is because you don't have a CSF, CSF leak right on top of that repair site, okay? You have brain tissue and you could really put things intracranially and put it above the bone and any pressure should be pushing on the side where this is above the bone and keep the graph into place. So that allow you to really have a nice seal by putting this thing on intracranially. And you could put other things extracranially also. And if it's a small defect, you could just plug it nicely and put another one. So it's just one is a seller. The, the cribriform is the second easiest in my, in my uh, practice. The plenum sphenoidal tuberculum cell region, if you have a leakage in that area, uh, not 
the lateral sense of the sphenoid um, where you would have a typical encephalo cell. But after surgery, that's probably the hardest I feel um, to repair. And the, the main reason for that is not only do you have, a, uh, you're, you're right under the third ventricle where there's a huge CSF leg there, but you have the opticism right in that um, side. And if you're going to put something in there to push, you're going to create trauma uh, and pressure over the optic and can cause uh, vision loss. So that area is very difficult because you have to be very meticulous and not cause any trauma to the, to the optic um, apparatus. So because of that, I feel as though you have to be more careful of, the, of those things, of these defects. And then the clivo um, craniosubical junction region is the second hardest, uh, in my opinion. And then the lateral corridors, where you have the lateral sphenoid, mercos cave, um, lateral cavernous sinus, the infratemporal fossa, going into the middle cranial fossa, those are somewhere in the middle. So cella is the easiest, cribriform is the second, plain with phenodal tuberculum cell is the worst. Um, the clivo cranial vertebral junction, I think, are probably the second hardest, and then the lateral corridor falls right in between. Okay. <coughs> Now, when you're making those repairs, the goal doesn't change. The goal is you, you want to provide a doable solid air watertight separation between the nasal cavity and the ventral skull base content. No matter how you do it, that's your goal. Um, you, it's important to make sure you eliminate any dead space to prevent any collections, maybe hematoma or seroma formation, because that could, it's going to be a nidus for infection that can lead to many nidus for, or abscess. You could do a single layer versus multi-layer um, in terms of your treatment. Uh, we, we site, uh, it's up to your experience, what you prefer. There's some um, out there who believe a multi-layer closure is better, um, but I'll leave that to um, people's experience and what they do. Some of those questions you need to, to answer, do you need the graphs? Uh, is it gonna be pedicle versus free? Um, do you get that at the time of harvesting? Do you take it early during your surgery or late after the surgery? All of these questions I'm going to discuss. And do you use lumbar drain um, or any type of CSF diversion afterward? If you do it, how long do you do it? And how do you make the decision? Do you use tissue glue? Um, and do you use packing? What kind of packing do you use? And uh, um, how long do you keep that packing in? Do you give them post-positive antibiotics? So I go over all of those um, again uh, based on the way I practice, and not necessarily what is necessarily the best, but this is just the way I do things based on uh, on what has worked in my hand. Um, when I'm talking about score based repair um, and reconstruction, I always like to present this is uh, this paper which was in 2010. So this is um, about 12 years ago, and now about um, 13 years, where they discuss large defect, and you, you see for large defect, we talk about regional or free flap, they would do very extensive things to repair those doors. Um, and then the um, nasoceptal flap was here for medium. Now in my practice, I would say that for most, most large core based defect, I typically would go with a nasoceptal flap. And if it's just a simple encephalocele, unless this patient has really high pressure, I would probably not use a nasoceptal flap. So typical CSF leak and an encephalocele in this patient, you see here, it's small encephalocele. The green is the fluorescent that was injected. This is the nasal septum. This is the left nasal cavity. Um, and then in here, once you repeat, you've seen this, I just go ahead here and put a little alloderm um, just to make sure I plug it, put a pleasure to, to plug this. And then I put a, a, a free mucosograft because I resected the middle turbinate, you could take the mucosa from the mucos, uh, from the middle turbinate um, to do this case. Now, otolaryngologists, um, we used to do those cases and we still do a lot of them um, alone. I do think as you're bu building a team with neurosurgery, it's very important, even in those simple cases, to do it as a team because that's going to allow you, you to build a relationship in cases that are not um, very difficult, and you start getting success in those small cases, and you learn 
from each other and how you do things. And then you develop and move up to doing the things that are really difficult. So for the otolaryngologists who feel as though they can do those cases alone and they don't need a neurosurgeon, I would advise you to still invite your neurosurgical colleagues in those um, easy to do cases so that you could build a relationship and success together before you tackle the most difficult cases. And this is how this case would look like about a year afterward. You see the nice repair site, uh, which is nicely healed. What about for the ethmoid region? So this is an example of how we would repair a CSF leak in the ethmoid region. Uh, this patient is a 50 year old man, right nasal obstruction um, for three months. And the patient came and you saw this mass and at that time, the patient reported that they were having some leakage as well. You make the diagnosis and you see this big encephalocell. So remember that this tissue is going to be dead tissue. Um, you could resect it. Uh, you could resect it with a microdebrider. You could use a bipolar. If it's very large, um, you want to resect as much of it as quickly. And then when you get near the spore base, you want to start being very cautious. May maybe at that time, you change to a less aggressive um, thing. So you see here, like that, huge mass. Then um, one thing that I like to do is open the whole sinuses so that I can analyze everything in the score base. This is um, the maxillary, we're not gonna spend time in there. You open the sphenoid just to make sure the whole interior score base is well exposed. You could analyze it. Uh, making sure there's not anything else um, where you're going to have um, any um, defects. So this is the maxillary. You have the sphenoid sphenoid cavity here under the skull base defect. Okay. And then you're going to go ahead and open the frontal sinus. This is anterior to the area of the skull base uh, defect. Um, this is important because after you make your, you, you, you uh, close the defect side, you don't want the frontal sinus to be, to be obstructed. So you want to make sure you open it you clearly see where it is. And then when you're doing your repair, you do the repair in a way to keep the frontal sinus spitting afterward. And then now we see the defect. Um, and then you're gonna, you, you could use different things um, to do it. Um, some people like fascia ladder. Um, in the beginning of my career, I would use fascia ladder, but then I found out that uh, using aloe make the case much quicker. You don't have to uh, be concerned about um, a, um, another incision that can cause significant discomfort for the patient. I like to use surgery cell um, to keep things into place. And then um, in here, I, I use a mucosal graft. You don't need a nasoceptor flap. Like I said, unless the, you, you found out that there was a lot of pressure when you um, uh, put your lumbar drain during the, uh, the beginning of the case, um, then I, I would not use a nasoceptor flap for, for that. So use the surgery cell, nicely put this into place. And then um, I like to use um, gel foam um, to make sure that uh, because I'm going to use a mirror cell, there's something that's going to protect the repair uh, from actually um, moving when you are removing the mirror cell packing. Um, so you go ahead here. This is gentamicin. Then put a pleasure. The gentamicin, uh, the um, um, gel foam, by the way, has gentamicin in it as an antibiotics. And then you could go ahead next, put a mirror cell packing. Again, some people like to use balloon. Um, I feel as though the mirror cell packing really take the shape of the score base and distribute pressure equally um, and uh, fits better. Um, in, in my in my opinion, um, I also again put bacitracin and inflate the gentamicin and uh, inflate the mirror cell packing with gentamicin, um, just to prevent any infection. I think this is a little bit more difficult if you're putting a balloon in there, um, which is not going to conform to the actual shape of the skull base. But um, as we all know, there's multiple ways to do things, and that are, that has worked in people, other people's hands. Um, what about the sphenoid region? This is a patient with a lateral sphenoid um, encephalocell, 50 year old middle, um, woman, middle age. Um, and you see the defect here in the lateral sphenoid. You see um, the, the small area of encephalocell. Um, so I use this um, 
technique that I've used using the transteroid approach in most of those cases. This is the right nasal cavity. Here you could see that there's a, the flow is in, into the nasal cavity. This is uh, orientation nasal septum, middle turbinate, the superior turbinate, and the sphenoid uh, pitmoidal recess here. So um, in this case, this patient has a huge contrabulosa in the way that I resected. Um, in retrospect, um, probably should have preserved the mucosa of the um, uh, contrabulosa because you could always use that later on to, um, to, to put a second layer. Um, using the mucosa really um, make things heal much quicker, um, although you don't need it. Uh, I do prefer it because it also decreases any significant costing um, during, during the healing process. And you could see the sphenoid, this is the antispilo cell now, and drilling part of the base of the pterygoid so that we have a nice um, view. Um, in this case, uh, we went and did it to a uninastral approach. Um, if you feel as though it's not easy to get access to a uninastral um, uni approach, you could do the same thing as you're doing in, in uh, a transphenoidal, do a posterior septectomy that would allow you to use instrument in the contralateral nasal cavity to have a better um, surgical freedom as you're doing the surgery. And in here, use a bipo. And then uh, once we've done this, we can use the uh, um, alloderm. Depending on the um, size of the defect, I may use that thin alloderm. Oh, I'm gonna use something that's much thicker um, to, to, make, to do that, with, that repair. And then once you put the alloderm to plug that, you, I like to use a pleasure over that um, and then suction on that, that really cause it to be really, um, really fit into the deeper. Then put a second layer here of alloderm and then um, put some surgery cell and, and um, gel foam um, over that, uh, that area and then um, use a mirror cell packing afterward. And this is the gel foam. As I mentioned before, the gel foam I put gentamicin solution or bacitracin in, um, and then use a mirror cell packing. The mirror cell packing is covered with um, um, bacitracin um, solution. If the patient is pain allergic, I would use Bactroben instead over the uh, bacitracin. And this is the mirror cell. And we typically take that out within about um, uh, around 10 days. And this is how the patient looked like four days afterward after removing um, um, the packet. What about for the frontal region? Well, the frontal region, um, although you don't typically see encephalocele in them, uh, you could also, you could see it and I've seen it. You could also have trauma, um, typically the most common reason why you would have CSF leak uh, in, this, in this region. This is a patient who, was, uh, uh, who came to neurosurgery, was admitted, sent home, and came back with huge pneumocephalus. And in this case, we decided to repair it endoscopically uh, to what called a subtotal lathropal push. So we're looking up now. This is the axilla of the middle turbinate on the left. This is the superior septectomy that we're doing. Um, and we set part of the superior portion of the uh, middle turbinate to get access to the area of the frontal sinus. So we're gonna go into the frontal sinus here. Remember this, the defect is right posterior to that. So you have to be cautious and then use um, biomanual um, binastral um, dissection um, to expose both frontal sinuses. So this is the right and left frontal sinus. We're going to continue to open the frontal sinus uh, completely to expose the posterior defect here. And you see this here, what is this big defect uh, in the posterior aspect? This is the right frontal sinus, the left frontal sinus. Um, and then once you have that big posterior table defects exposed, uh, there's multiple things you could do. This is a typically a case where in the past people would cranialize, but now you could just go endoscopically, open the frontal sinus widely to an endoscopic lathrope or subtotal lathrope uh, procedure. And then in this case, because of the size of the defect, I'm gonna use the thick alloderm to really fill 
into that defect. And the good thing about the allodome is that it's gonna take the shape of that, um, of that defect um, the way you would want it. So use this probe and, um, and then once you've done this, you really wanna make sure this really is snogged into that defect. So I'm gonna use a um, pleasure to put the pleasure after that over this and then suction on the pleasure. So you take a moist pleasure, you put it there and that's gonna push this to really fit nicely into the defect um, so that you have the best opposition of that um, graft onto the defect here. And you see that uh, as we've done this, looks really nice. Um, and then at this point, you could decide whether you're gonna use another layer of alloderm um, or if you're gonna just use a free graft. So in this case, we decided to go with a free graft. Remember, this was a traumatic case. This is not a patient who had a high, um, high um, intracranial uh, pressure. So you don't necessarily need a nasoceptal flap. So I think use this free graft from the middle turbinate, marked it, of course, so that we make sure we, we, we keep the mucosal surface outside. And we did, remember we did a subtotal arthrop, the contralateral frontal sinus recess uh, was not touched, even though we did something, which is sort of like a three quarter lothrop to, to, to get to it. And then you use the gel form here, uh, which has gentamicin as an antibiotics and you put that over the, the uh, repair, um, suction on in there. And then uh, I use the mirror cell packing again to reinforce it. Uh, I feel as though again, the mirror cell is nicer than a balloon because it really take the shape of that um, defect nicely. And, um, and this patient did very well um, without any issues. Okay. And this is why after we remove that, you see the gel form um, still in the, in the scorbis uh, repair site. Now for the residents that are around here, I do uh, wanna mention that in um, 2012, um, Dr. Lou, my neurosurgical colleague and I, we did write this um, um, nuance for the, uh, how you would repair um, defect in the scorbis with high, high flow leak. Um, using the nasoceptal flap, when and 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 um, when to and when not to use them, and how do you shape the nasoceptal flap? So we're gonna go in there. So what about much bigger cribriform defect that may be um, after surgery, and you have leaks? How do you repair those? Well, in my training, if you had something like this, um, Dr. Cassiano would use one thick layer of alloderm, and he would put it as inlay and outlay. Uh, put it in there and uh, use gel foam to really snug it above the rim of the defect uh, intracranially. And um, I, I never understood why that worked. It was very scary to me that you just put something um, as alloderm, which is not vascularized in a big defect, um, and, it, and it worked. And during my fellowship again, I, um, 2007, 2008, he had no leak which I thought was an act of, uh, uh, of God uh, because it didn't make sense to me. Uh, but uh, when I came in New Jersey, um, I started doing the same thing and, and it worked. But the problem between the South where it was and the, and the North that I went to was it was more dry and cold. And those patients, they would heal, but they would take much longer to heal. And they would have a lot and a lot of crossing in their nose, right? Um, then um, the second year um, that I started working at Rutgers, um, Dr. Lou came and Dr. Lou didn't feel comfortable putting in um, uh, alloderm against the brain. He wanted some other kind of tissue and working together, you have to make compromise. I told him this works, but he, he wanted to do it differently. So I'll get to that. Um, other way to fix those things is there's a gasket scale closure with a Dr. Anon and Schwartz, which um, uh, we don't do at Rutgers, but that also has shown some um, success. And then the button graph, which is what uh, the people in Jefferson, um, Dr. Evans and Rosen use, um, which also is a good way to fix things. It's just not the way we, we, we do things in our own institution. So um, because of Dr. Lou and in his training, they always use fascia ladder. Um, I 
changed the way I did things where I would just, to please him, put the uh, fascia ladder above the brain because he was not happy with alloderm against the brain. And then I would still put the alloderm after that to close it. So we compromise and it helped uh, in term, to some degree with our relationship. Um, but the same problem with the exposed alloderm in the north didn't, didn't, didn't help because those patients would have a lot of crusting and this would take three months to mucosalize, which was a pain when you have to degrade those patients in the, in the office. So, um, so I changed and evolved a little bit. And um, now, um, I think this was in 2013 or so, I decided to do, okay, so I'm gonna put the fascia ladder for Dr. Terlo so that he's happy. I'm gonna put the alloderm the way that Cassiano taught me. And then because I'm being tortured in the office, let's put a mucosal graph over it. Then I would put the nasoceptor flap, creating this triple layer um, um, repair that really help uh, with everything. Uh, and um, uh, by doing this, uh, we were very, very successful at really um, um, making sure everyone was happy. Um, and when we looked at um, the way our patients did, um, we felt as though we were getting no leaks and we didn't even need a lumbar drain. And um, this was again published in, in 2013 with our experience um, with this. So this is your typic the typical way you would do it. Um, so you have this um, like surgery cell over the brain here, and then we we'll put the fascia ladder. Um, and after the fascia ladder, you would put the layer of alloderm. And we put surgery cell after each one of those steps and then put this here. And then more surgery cell and, um, and then use the nasoceptor flap. And this was a, for the frontal region, you see the endoscopic lath work. Now there was some concern about whether if you put the surgery cell that's gonna decrease healing because it's been proven that in, um, um, in, vi um, in vitro, the surgery scale can decrease blood flow and, 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 and decrease healing. Um, but what I found out was by putting the surgery cell, the repair was more stronger. There was this inflammatory reaction that formed and the scar bend that formed was really, really thick, um, which is something we wanted. So we started doing that and then uh, um, we started doing it also for malignant tumor and we changed the way we did thing at this point where I convinced James that, well, those patients are having pain when we make the incision to get the fascia ladder. And um, after a few years working together, I was ultimately successful in, in making him realize that, you know, everybody is putting alloderm against the brain. Um, there shouldn't be any reason why we should make the incision and get the fascia ladder. So we do still fascia ladder in some instances, but for most of those cases now, we don't do that anymore. We just go with the alloderm if you have it. Um, and 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 we pair the score base with two layers of alloderm and the flap afterward. So this one is a patient who had a malignant tumor, um, an adenocarcinoma that was resected by an outside doctor. They send the patient to us. Now in those cases, I would elevate the nasoceptor flap in the contralateral side because um, I want to make sure the flap in the ipsilateral side doesn't have um, any malignant cell into it. So that's a little bit of a variation when you're going to repair scorbis defect with cancer. Um, if it's a small cancer on the ipsilateral side that you're the first person doing the surgery, you may consider taking it in the ipsilateral side. However, if it's a patient where the nose was manipulated before and you still have to remove cancer in the contralateral side, um, I, I don't like to, to elevate the flap in the same, same place. So in this case here, uh, we this is the we section um, stage, I'm gonna move this forward. And then once we finish with the resection, we already had the nasoceptor flap um, taken out in the contralateral right side. And then we're gonna do a triple layer closure uh, as described um, in our previous manuscript. Uh, in this case, uh, by that time I've convinced James that we don't need to put a layer of um, alloderm, a, a layer of uh, fascia ladder. We just went ahead and we used the two layer of the thick alloderm here. Um, and as I mentioned before, after each layer, you put uh, the surgery cell to sort of like hold it in place nicely. Um, and um, 
after the second layer, try to take the nasoceptal flap here, which is from the right side. And um, if the nasoceptal flap was not reaching anteriorly, you could do that, what's called the relaxing incision, which I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes to make sure that flap really lays nicely in the anterior skull base um, in here. And um, again, you put the, um, a lot of um, gel foam with gentamicin and then the um, mirror cell packing. In most of those cases that we remove everything in the ethmoid um, and the whole skull base is exposed, I feel as though you need more than one mirror cell. Typically we put about two to three mirror cell to really support the skull base with their side. And this is what this patient would look like, possibly on laser endoscopy. Um, and this is, I believe, after about three months or so. Um, and the patient needed uh, to get radiation, but did very well. Um, this is probably, it's been all about, uh, I think, 10 years out, and it's still doing great without any recurrence. Now, when I started this talk, I mentioned the um, plenum sphenoidal and tuberculum celli area, which is the area that I, I, I don't like. And I'll tell you guys why I don't like it. This is again, um, the, the, the toughest one. Um, this is a paper that I actually wrote, um, if you guys wanna pick it up, specifically describing this area and how you repair it. So when we looked at our initial 99 repairs um, of those cases, out of those 99 repairs, we had a success rate of 97%. Uh, there were three leaks that occurred to me. This is 2013. Um, and um, so by that time, I was about um, five years out of fellowship. And it came to me that all the, 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 the leaks that I had came from one area. Um, and while the overall success was, 90, was 97%, in the plenum, um, um, tuber, um, plenum defects, it was only about 86.4%, 86 which caused me to really analyze why was it that this was the area where patients were, were leaking. And the reason is again, because when you're doing things here and you're, 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 you're fixing them, you have the optic apparatus right here. And you cannot push too much thing as I mentioned in here. If you push it, you're gonna press in this. So you're almost left at putting something extra Manually. Some people do put things, I mean, um, I'm sorry, intradual. Do put things intradually, but I feel as though you're taking a risk with the optic cars and if there's any pressure there. So for that reason, we tend not to do it. The other thing that we realize is when we're removing tumors in there, when we open the score base, you have to decide how wide you want to open the optic canal. If you open the optic canal all the way uh, where the optic is coming out, it allows the resection to be much, much easier. It's safer, uh, specifically at an area where you're dealing with the carotid artery and the optic apparatus. You really wanna make sure when you're doing your dissection of the tumor, you have enough surgical freedom and visualization. You could not open the optic canal that would make your repair a little bit easier because you're not going to have the optic the optic nerve coming right at the edge of your of your defect of your def uh, defect but you have to pick your battles and we typically prioritize the resection and um, would actually put something sort of like extra cranial and then um, use two layers of um, of fascia ladder um, this is one area where we still tend to put fascia ladder because we always are concerned that the alloda may swell up and push on the optic. And then we use a um, nasal um, septal flap. And remember also in here, right at that area behind the optic, superior posterior is the third ventricle. So you have a C CSF lake sitting on top of that, of that defect where any pressure in the brain now is gonna work against you, as opposed to in the anterior score base near the cribriform, where the pressure when you put something intra dual intracranial is gonna help to fit your graft, hold it in place, 
So for that reason, this is one area that I think you get, we, we are getting most of the of the leak. This is more dangerous. That's why we typically would divert the CSF in here um, to not allow any pressure from that CSF leak to push in here, since you cannot put something intracranially the way you would want. And this is the way these patients look like we'll stop. We tend to always preserve the middle turbinate when we're doing those cases um, as well. So post-operatively, what do we do? No lumbar joint to avoid intracranial hypotension in the overwhelming majority, except again in the tuberculum cell region and, and sometime um, in the um, um, clival region. Um, the, the patient gets CSF precautions, bed rest, head of bed elevated at about 30 degrees. They get a fully catheter intra up, school, school softener, and cough medications. They ambulate progressively. The nasal packing is kept in there for about seven to 10 days. While they're in the hospital, they get IV antibiotics. And then when they go home, they go home on post-operative pure antibiotics until we remove the packing in the office, um, which again is about seven to 10 days when I do that um, endoscopically in the office and uh, will explore the, the repair. Now, as we started re repairing um, those defects and we started getting bigger and bigger, <laughs> Um, defects, one of the questions I had was, do we need to put something rigid in there? Because we were actually now removing things from the posterior wall of the frontotinus all the way to the tuberculum cellae. And I was concerned whether or not, uh, by not putting a rigid fixation, whether the brain was going to sag into the nose. Um, so when we did the analysis and looked at um, those cases, we found out that in about half the cases, actually, the triple uh, um, repair technique caused scarring and the scar base actually elevated up. And then in about half of them, there was a small descent of the scar base, but nothing significant. The biggest one we had was about 3.9 millimeter descent, which was really insignificant. And this is the numbers showing the different pathology and the uh, descent versus upward um, contraction of the scar base. So if you use the triple uh, repair technique, even when you have very large wide defect from the posterior of the frontal sinus to the tuberculum cellae and from one um, lamina to the other lamina propitia, you could repair it endoscopically without significant um, defect, uh, brain descent. What about tissue glue? Do we do tish use tissue glue in our um, uh, institution? Uh, well, in my fellowship, um, Dr. Cassiano never used them. So when I came here, I would not use them. And between Dr. Lou and myself, if he was repairing them, because in his training, he, he used um, tissue glue, he would use tissue glue. Um, if I was the one repairing it, I did not. So we also came back to a, a compromise. Um, we looked at all of those cases and we published this paper that was in 2012. So that was about four years after we came out, um, um, that I came out. And we found that there was one leak at that time and the leak was coming out of the, 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 the cases where he used the, um, um, the tissue glue. Not to say that that was the reason that the, the leak occurred, but this is to say that the tissue glue really doesn't do much. Um, it's a matter of being being uh, um, very cautious um, the way you repair it and being meticulous um, in your way as you're putting every single layer. Um, if you do that, you don't need tissue glue, so we don't use tissue glue. And tissue glue could be quite expensive also um, for, for patients. So to use it when you may not need it, um, it's, it's probably not, uh, not appropriate. But um, I would say people should do things based on what they feel is gonna be best for their patients. This is our experience. This is what works in our hand. It doesn't necessarily have to be the same, the same for every center. So do what makes you, um, uh, what make, makes your patients uh, better. Um, this is another paper now when I looked at, when we looked at overall, does it matter if something is in the cellar versus if it is in the, um, um, one of the extended areas? And uh, the, the idea with this paper was that, well, we're going to look at it and we're going to find out that when you do the extended cases, you are going to have way more leakage. Well, we did the analysis, but because we were very meticulous in, in, into the extended um, endonasal repair, we found out that there was really no significant risk 
um, by doing those cases with the extended approach. I do believe inherently extended hair site um, are gonna give you more CSF link. Um, but even though we didn't find a statistical significant difference, we do believe that if you're meticulous, when you repair them um, and use the nasal septal flap where you have to, you're gonna find no significant difference between doing a cellar versus an expanded um, score based uh, defect repair, okay? So just be meticulous with your surgical technique and you'll be fine. And it doesn't matter the necessarily size of the defect, okay? So you could go big meningiomas. Um, if you're meticulous with your closure, you should be fine. And um, do we need to put lumbar drain or any other type of CSF, uh, um, um, CSF um, diversion? Again, I wrote this paper in 2012, and at that time, I concluded that you do not need to use it. Overall, it doesn't, it doesn't help. However, um, I do believe that, again, for the plenum sphenoidale, you probably should divert it. Um, I do believe that for the um, um, clivo um, craniovertebral junction, you probably should, should, should consider that. Um, and if you're going to do those, what about the clivo regions? What do you do? Um, in terms of the repair. So what we do is we collect the flap before uh, we go in there. So this is an example of um, a patient with a mucosal sparing posterior, uh, uh, with, with a uh, corneal vertebral junction um, lesion we're gonna reset. And in this case, you see the way um, we, would, we would make the um, incisions here to go ahead and um, do the, the approach. And I would elevate this graph and put it into the middle meatus. This is the way I used to do it. Um, and then go ahead and remove the um, septal cartilage and um, vomeric bone, and then make another incision in the controlado mucosa, not at the same level, um, and then go ahead expose the uh, cranial vertebral junction to go ahead. So this is the way I used to do it. I don't think this is the best way to do it anymore. I do believe that uh, there's much better way to preserve the mucosa. And at the end, if you didn't need the flap, you should go ahead and replace it. One um, a mistake that I think we commonly make is, is that when we make those incisions, we expect the flap is gonna be the same. And making this right at the junction here, is not good because this graph always contract a little bit during the case. And it's not easy to sort of like open it to get it to the same size. And it might cause a defect inferiorly. So if you're gonna make your incision, don't make it right at the border. You could make it more uh, along the, the hard palate or even under the inferior turbinate. So we then wrote another paper to address this um, um, a few years back. So this is 2016. We had a three order valuation um, in terms of how to do this. I'm gonna go over them real quick here. Um, so um, in here, you make one incision more interior and then the other incision is more posterior. I don't make an incision here anymore. And then go ahead, we move that's like all the way posteriorly here and then get access to the cranial vertebral junction so that you could do your, your resection. I'm gonna show some videos of this. And then if you need more space in one side, if the tumor is more towards this side, then you could go ahead and make the incision and, and uh, on the floor here under the inferior turbinate to, to make this, elevate this flap. I leave this attached superiorly, which is not something I used to do before. And this one is attached superiorly and inferiorly. And then if I need, to make this much bigger because the tumor is big, then I'm gonna go ahead and make another incision to the contralateral side, elevate all of them, <coughs> a nice access. Um, and that allows you to repair it much quicker. So I'm gonna go real quick here. So this is your first incision here on this side, followed by the second incision. Again, you wanna make the second incision more posteriorly so that you don't have them at the same level. Um, which is gonna create a perforation. And then here, once you make the incision, you can go ahead and elevate and remove 
so that you could um, remove the mucosa. Remember that this is the flash under here, and this is also attached superiorly. So keep and going more posteriorly here. You go all the way to the keel of the sphenoid all the way posteriorly. And then expose everything. And then in the contralateral side, remember that incision is more posterior as opposed to the other one that's more interior in the contralateral side here. So elevate both flaps, leave them attached to and inferiorly. And then go ahead and remove the washroom of the sphenoid. Drill everything posteriorly here. And if you need to go more inferiorly, you're gonna open this mucosa and follow it. Then you could go ahead, do your drilling of the clivers, take that inferiorly as low as you can through those tunnels. And at the end, to expose all of this here, you could remove your tumor. If there's a leak, then you can decide which graph you need to. If you feel as though as you're giving the exposure, things are really restricted, then what you would do, if it's on this side, you're gonna go ahead and make an incision as we're doing this on the right side. And that allows you to then elevate this here. So you're gonna have more surgical freedom on this side but this is pedicled posteriorly and superiorly. And if you need more, this is here. It's a very nice opening with a lot of freedom and you could use both nostrils because remember you have an incision um, also in the other mucosa. So you do have space on both sides. And then if now you really need more space because the tumor is really big, you're gonna make an incision under the other inferior turbinate. And then go ahead and elevate that mucosa so that now you have the whole cavity wide open so that you have access in doing your surgery. And, and your neurosurgeon, um, as an otolaryngologist, are really gonna love it because um, uh, the only thing better than that is just to resect the whole nose and let them just go ahead to the, to, to the back and do their, 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 their surgery. And when you're done with this, um, you could use one of those graphs to, um, to do the scorbis repair side if you have it. Uh, if you have a leak, if you don't have a leak, you just go ahead and replace this graph. This graph, and because you've taken them so far lateral, this portion is gonna sit nicely over the um, hard palate. Um, and when you look into the nose after I do these cases and make this approach, um, you cannot see anything. It's, the nose looks pretty much like it was untouched. Um, and this is the contralateral side here. You put both of them out, down, and um, those patients do very, very well. So, um, and again, if you do need to use one of the of the flap, so you could just resect the superior, superiorly and then use that to, to, to close it and then put the other one back. And the final nasal cavity would look this way um, with the area where you add your repair site after your resection. And this is the contralateral side. So um, what about early harvesting? I think one of the um, question was that I mentioned before is when do you actually harvest the nasal septal flap? If you're gonna do a, a surgery and you have a tumor, you think you're gonna have a leak, I typically would go ahead 
and elevate the flap before. Uh, in almost all of those cases in our this paper, if you really look at your anatomy, the um, tumor, uh, a radiograph, you could tell when you're gonna need um, the graft. Um, there was only one case, which is this specific case that I thought that I'm gonna need a, a, a flap that I didn't use it. Um, this case here was a patient with osteoblastoma that I went to resect. I thought that I was gonna have a scorbis defect here, elevated the flap before, and then after I resected it, there was no leak here and this peeled off the door. Um, and um, what I did was I just took the, the, the flap and put it back into the septum and used a dorsement to hold it in place. Um, so I did not resect the door in this case. And this was big because about a year later, this patient ended up having a recurrence. Um, and um, I had to go back, we said that uh, area of recurrence, and we still ended up having to use that, that, that um, flap. And even though we did elevate it one year later before and put it back, um, with meticulous technique, we were still able to elevate the same, the same flap um, and put it back up there, so the patient did well. So I do favor taking those out before. I think um, you're gonna get a bigger flap that's less traumatized. Take it out in the beginning, put it in the nasopharynx or in the maxillary sinus, do the resection and then use it afterward. Okay. Um, is there an, an advantage to doing endoscopic score based reconstruction of large dua with a flap? Um, well, I think if you do use a, gra a, a vascularized graft, you do do better in those large defects. In small defects, I think it doesn't matter, except if you have a case of increasing intracranial hypertension. I do believe using a graft is important. Um, one other uh, um, question that we have is, what about if somebody had a craniotomy before? Can you do um, a, um, a repair endoscopically? Um, I do believe it, help, it works very well. We actually have written about this in 2012, where uh, what I call a salvage endoscopic nasoceptal flap for those patients who have failed um, transcranial approaches. Although I believe that in most of those cases, uh, unless it was a tumor that needed to be done to an open approach, those things should have been repaired uh, with a combination with um, um, intranasal and uh, uh, transcranial uh, approach as well. Uh, some pearls to maximize the reach of the vascularized pedicle nasoceptal flap. How do you make sure your flap reach? Well, there's a few things you could do to a flap so that you understand how to design it. There's six maneuvers that I'm gonna tell you. One is, <coughs> If you're going to want a flap to go really far anteriorly, you want the length of the flap to be long, then you want to make the incisions as anterior as possible. So this is almost like coming uh, to the area of a hemitransfixion incision into the nose. That's going to give you more length in your graft. So if a, a, if a defect is anterior in the curve form, you want to come very, very anteriorly to make sure you can have something that's going to reach. So that's one, one uh, maneuver that helps. A second maneuver is um, making the incision really laterally here, as opposed to in here. This is important. When you put the incision here, um, what that does is give you a much wider flap. You also have to make the incision on the, uh, um, above all the way in the nasal septal angle here, and that gives you a much, much wider flap, okay? Um, so if you want a wide flap, a flap that's going to be bilateral, uh, you're whipping something from the laminar propitia to the laminar propitia, that's what's going to give it to you by going laterally, okay? Um, and so don't make it here, make it more lateral. And in some cases, you can actually include the mucosa of the inferior terminate in there. The problem when you do that is this mucosa is going to be very redundant and has a lot of memory. So that may be an issue um, if you want to lay it nicely into the score base. But you can go and include this as sort of the nasoceptal flap as well. Uh, this is an example in the cadaveric dissection. And I've done that in patients as well, where we make the lateral incision all the way uh, above the inferior turbinate and take all the mucosa over the septum, floor, and then here. But there's memory in this area here. And um, you have to sort of like be very careful how you're going to get this thing to be filling uh, out um, into the score base. The third maneuver is the coronary releasing incision for flap rotation. 
Um, if you want your flap to come interiorly and you want it to, to be free, uh, you're gonna make that relaxing incision here. But the more lateral you take that incision, the more freedom you're gonna have. So that's the third um, maneuver that I would do um, to actually have more freedom with your nasal septal flap. Um, and we do that a lot um, in our cases, okay? And then the maneuver number four is what you call the relaxing transverse incision at the level of the pedicle for anterior elongation. So in this case, you have a flap, this is coming anteriorly, and you're trying to put it here, but it's not wishing because your flap is too, is too, um, is too short here. So what you do in those cases here, you make an incision, what you call a relaxing incision that's sort of like parallel to the pedicle, be careful not to cut the pedicle, and that's gonna allow a, a little rotation that's gonna uh, make this thing go further up. Do so you see this here as we're making this incision? Once you make this incision, this goes posteriorly, this can come a little bit more anteriorly. And I'll show you a quick video of that. So this is one where it was difficult to reach. So we went ahead and then we elevate this and we'll make that relaxing incision. Again, be careful not to cut the pedicle. It has to be just parallel to the pedicle. And then that portion is gonna go and fit nicely into the plenum sphenoidale area here. And then that causes the flap to cause a little bit of rotation and you could get more anterior extension of the, of the, of the uh, flap. Um, this is a paper where we, we, we've written about the relaxing transverse incision to get the flap to be elongated and give you a more um, um, ergonomic cl um, closure of the skull base. The fifth maneuver is resection of the sphenoid washroom and sphenoid septations. A lot of time you have to lay things down um, over the, um, the, the clival recess here. So if you have this bone, the keel uh, um, of the sphenoid of the clivus coming out, this is gonna really take space. So you resect that, go posteriorly with it, and that would allow you a better um, rotation of your flap. And then the sixth maneuver is um, initially putting the flap laterally. So if you have a defect in the plenus phenoidal and tuberculum cellar, typically you could just, instead of going straight back up, you go from the side with the flap and that can give you a little bit better placement uh, and elongation of your flap. So as example here, to instead of putting the pedicle back here, you go on the side here um, and position it. Okay, so those are the six maneuvers. Now, uh, I'd like to say that not all score based repairs should be done purely endoscopically. Um, what about uh, a case like this where you have a patient who doesn't have any mucosa into the nose? This is a patient who had a um, no endocrine carcinoma after radiation. You see all of this tumor destroy the septum here. Uh, you don't have that available to you uh, to use a nasal septal flap. But we went ahead, um, patient treated with chemo radiation, inadequate response, so you're gonna resect it. And we decided to do it endoscopically. Well, if you're gonna do it endoscopically, there was bony defect, uh, the nasal bone was involved, so you're gonna do that. And then at the end, you have this big defect, nothing is left in the nasal cavity. You have the extended sphenoid here, and then anteriorly, you have your lothrop cavity. Um, so big defect, you have the um, surgery cell in here. Uh, so how do you repair something like this if you don't have anything? Well, in this specific case, what we did was we put the alloderm. This patient was previously radiated and failed radiation, remember? So you're gonna have to put some vascular eye tissue in here. This is not a case where I would just leave the alloderm in there. Um, in, in a patient that was previously radiated and hope that that's gonna help. Um, so in that case, we took the vascularized tissue from the, um, using a bicoronal incision and elevated a um, pericranial flap here. And then put a, an opening in the anterior portion of the uh, frontal sinus here to a tree fine and go ahead and use that pedicle that, um, pedicle pericranial flap here through that defect and then went into the nasal cavity, pulled that out um, and covered this, this defect. Again, um, a case where you've been, the patient has been um, 
exclusive radiation, uh, you got to make sure you have vascularized uh, tissue in here to repair the, the defect so that you don't have a punctuative CSF leak. Um, okay. So this is one of those examples. What about this one here? Uh, this is a patient where we use a power median forward flap. This patient had a previous um, surgery where you did an open and uh, endoscopic resection of this um, San Lizzo uh, um, squamous cell carcinoma, was treated with radiation, and then afterward had radio, uh, uh, radio necrosis, had multiple um, failed repair. Um, endoscopically, there was no um, nasoceptor flap, and free graft would not work in this case. Um, ended up having persistent uh, intracranial um, air. So in this case, um, this is the defect. So what did we do? Well, we take the actual skin uh, and did a palm medium forward flap, just like you would do to repair the nose. Take this. Similarly, we put an incision, uh, a, a tree fine, and then um, use this to repair that score base defect, make sure the site is well uh, prepared, demucosalize um, or remove any scar tissue that you could remove. And keyhole drill here into the region. Make it wide enough so that you don't strangle the uh, pedicle of that of that flap and then push it through the keyhole and then that fit nicely into the score base, um, the score base defect. Yeah. And this is the way this healed afterward. Okay. Yeah. Well, you've taken this and rotated it intracranially. And of course you have to go and divide the pedicle attachment um, later on. So to do those things, again, you need a good team of physician with the appropriate training. I think neurosurgical training complement the otolaryngology training. Start doing easy things together. Even though you can do it alone, try to resist that temptation so that you could build a relationship uh, with, with your colleagues from the other subspecialty. You need adequate hospital support. The, the hospital has to provide you with the equipment that you need. Um, you can be the greatest team, the greatest surgeon, but if you don't have the things that you need to do a good job, you're going to end up hurting patients. So make sure your hospital is behind you, um, which in some cases could be quite, uh, quite difficult. And then uh, you also have to select your patient very carefully. I would say in the beginning of your career, uh, you don't want to really um, select the most difficult cases. You want to start tackling things that are easier. Um, stay in touch with your mentors, um, ask for questions, um, keep an open mind. And then uh, if you need to change things, uh, you need to change things. And then there have to be a motivation to push the limits in, in the way you're doing things. So going to courses together with uh, your neurosurgical colleague and your ENT colleague is important. Stay in the lab, try things together uh, um, in terms of repair of those, of, of those defects so that you could, you could be more comfortable. Um, some plug-in for, for something in terms of um, score-based defect. This is a, a clinic that I, that I wrote that uh, tell you some of the nuances if you're dealing with malignancies and how you repair the score base if they have, if they have a leakage. Um, this is another book with Dr. Cassiano that has a lot of uh, great anatomy um, on um, how to do those, those things that I've just mentioned. And um, I do have a um, international clinical observership, which is about one week to three months for people who would like to come to uh, to Rutgers um, to see what, what, what we do. So you guys are welcome anytime. Um, and again, this is our team, fellows, residents with their kids and family around New York City. So we do get a chance to take them on a, on a um, cruise um, for, all the hard work they, they do uh, for, for uh, with our team um, couldn't, couldn't do it um, alone without all of these guys' support. So thank you. And um, if there's any questions, I'll take them now.
Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Eloy. It's a, it was a remarkable presentation uh, with incredible cases. <laughs> I enjoyed the watching every single video of the repair. Uh, we have some questions and comments in the chat. Uh, before I start reading, I have one uh, question of my own. Uh, so uh, when a patient come, presents with already complicated case of meningitis, uh, what would you rather do? Would you wait uh, to for the meningitis to resolve and to be treated, or would you operate in an acute phase? Like, yeah, yeah. So it, it all depends on how the patient is doing. Of course, if the patient is really, really sick, and um, then I probably would try to to close that repair. But in the majority of those cases, what I've seen is just treating those patients um, with IV antibiotics helps. And what you see in patients who've gotten meningitis, um, and I'm sure most of you guys have realized that, the um, inflammation can very often close those leaks by treating them uh, for the meningitis. <laughs> and the problem is more, what do you do after that? After you've um, treated them with IV antibiotics and then it closes, um, do you go back right away? Do you plan on going and fixing them? Uh, that's more of, a, of the challenge that I face when um, people try to send me patients, they say they're leaking, they come to the office, they've got an antibiotics, and then it stops. Um, and I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that one because um, um, very often I don't do anything and then they come back and then they have, they have meningitis again with a little leak. Then I would go and repair it. So if the patient is very, very sick, um, I may just try to, to, to stop it right there while they're on IV antibiotics. If they're getting better, and um, like, since so many of them have gotten better with it, I may just wait and see. Thank you so much for your uh, response. Uh, we have a question uh, from Ksenia Klimenko, I guess from Ukraine. Uh, one do, why don't you use... Russian. Russian. Okay. Russian. Uh, why don't you use a uh, fat graft for the closure? Other uh, question sounds... Yeah, I don't. I don't think I've really known. It. There's only one area that I use fat, is when I use. I need to actually fill up a space. So let's say you have a clivo defect, and in the and it went all the way deep, and I'm I'm concerned about I'm gonna have this space there, and I need a filler. Then I would just still try to repair with something to reconstruct the doer, and then after that. I would go ahead and then put the fat on that and then put something over the fat so that I don't have that deep recess into the clivus. Um, but uh, I, have, I have not found fat to be that, that, that useful. A lot of other people use it. Of course, there's multiple ways to do things. Um, it's probably part of my training. Um, my mentor never used, has never used fat. Um, so I've never gotten to using it to, to, for those repair. So, mm -hmm. yeah. but again, you. there's multiple ways of doing things, and I'm sure in other people's hands that that works. Thank you. A uh, medical student uh, from Pakistan studying in Georgia, Afan Ahmad, is saying thank you so much for uh, such an informative presentation. Uh, next question from Ionescu, uh, 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 Christian. Thank you for the interesting presentation. Uh, would like to ask, apart from what you talked about, did you encounter any CSF leak in patients with sphenoidal uh, pneumonodilatants? Um, uh, and apart from uh, that, the sinuses usually have no bony defects in the pathology, in this pathology. CSF leak, yeah. if there's no bony defect, is that the yeah. question? Uh, yes, and uh, sphenoidal uh, pneumonia dilatants. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. No, I have, I have actually not. Um, there have to be, if you're gonna have a CSF leak, uh, one we are, there's typically going to be um, a defect. Uh, you cannot have it without the defect. Um, I mean, there are cases where the only thing I can think, you, you may think it's coming from the sphenoid, um, maybe coming from the tegmen and it's going to the eustachian tube and you cannot find it in the scorbis. But for you to have a CSF leak, by definition, there have to be a dual defect and there have to be a bony defect. Uh, you may not be able to see it 
uh, necessarily, but it's it's there. Uh, you may be missing it, but it 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 can. I don't think it can. It cannot happen without the the bony defect. Okay. Um, the the ideal something even if you were to say something from Sternberg's canal, which is um, the embryo, embryologic remnant, which is not typically where they come from, there still would be a, a connection between the intracranial cavity and the nasal cavity where this is this is coming. So there's a defect. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Dr. Hassan, would you like to uh, comment? Uh, Ksenia, thank you uh, to Professor, but uh, she wrote to me directly. Uh, I will read it. Thank you okay. so much. Amazing presentation, great cases and videos. Ksenia from Russia says, uh, mm -hmm. there is Adam Aran among us. He is a ENT specialist, associated professor, and we are working in the same hospital. I want to hear his thoughts, opinions. Thank you, Dr. Eloy, for your excellent speech. Uh, and you, as you mentioned, uh, a good relationship between uh, neurosurgeons and otolaryngology is very important in these cases. And uh, I would like to add uh, a little thing. I will uh, mostly use topical fluorescein uh, uh, because uh, we can't use intratecal fluorescein. Uh, in first cases, it's really uh, helpful. Uh, for uh, the surgeons who did this surgery uh, not that much. And it uh, really helps to confirm a, a good uh, watertight uh, closure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, um, it's one quick thing that I, I probably should mention um, now that you talk about the flow is and I should have had a slide in there. If you're gonna use intrathecal fluorescein, you need to pre-medicate those patients with anti-seizure medications, uh, with Benadryl and, and Decodron. So um, in the papers that I presented, I actually would, would do that, okay? Um, so keep that in mind because there's been cases where people have had some issues, they've had seizures, where, but I, you should still pre-medicate them with Benadryl Decodron and anti seizure medications before you, you inject the flow. Uh, okay, thank you. We've got a few questions in the chat. Uh, Temi uh, o -O -O Ogaji from the UK, medical student in Georgia, is asking uh, Thank you very much for the excellent presentation, doctor. I would like to ask in cases where complications relating to the optic nerve develop following the surgery, how long would you ideally wait before tackling this? Sorry, could you please uh, repeat so the question? If you have, uh, if we have an optic nerve compression after the surgery, so uh, how long do you wait before you do decompression, I guess, yeah. Oh, no, I'm, I'm not gonna wait. Gonna, no, no, if you, if you, if you, um, because once you, you can really establish this is what's happening. If you don't know mm -hmm. that this is what's happening, yeah, you could try to figure out what's happening. I think once you know that this is what it is, you got to go um, remove it if it's post up, right? You're talking about you do the surgery, and then after your surgery, the patient has sign of optic mm -hmm. nerve um, compression. You need to go and remove whatever packing you have. Um, is that what they're talking about or they're talking yes, about? Yes, 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 that was the, exactly the question, yeah. Uh, and we have one more, Ana Luisa Stoko. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to participate in this class. I'm Brazilian, big fan of your work. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, thank you for your contribution. Dr. Hassan, would you like to uh, invite some of the speakers to uh, comment? No, uh, mm -hmm. I think everything is okay. And mm -hmm. we thank you very much, Professor Eloy, for this uh, wonderful lecture. And I want to thank everyone who joined us this evening. Mm -hmm. We had more than 70 participants uh, and listeners from all yeah. over the world. Same and thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, thank you again for Professor Eloy for such an interesting presentation. Thanks for the opportunity to, to share my uh, my experience. Thank you.